Good evening and welcome on into the overnight edition of From Day One. Art Bell with his guest is waiting right on the other bend and let's collect from the mailbag as I discuss who we have tonight. Art Bell will go back to July 28th, 2015. Tonight, his guest is Richard Dolan, noted UFO expert. So we get to the meat and potatoes of what Art Bell is known for. So we go to Midnight in the Desert from July 28, 2015, from the world's 25 time zones and the great American Southwest. As we start tonight's march from day one through Dominion. Art, take it away. From the high desert and the great American Southwest, I bid you all good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whatever the case is, wherever you are in the world. Covered entirely by this program, Midnight in the Desert. Welcome, I'm Art Bell. Let me do the usual beginning here uh, while we're getting this program started. Um, the rules are no bad language and only one call per show. Other than that, there are no rules. I want to thank, as always, Telos for the great sound. By the way, if you've got earbuds or, you know, some sort of headphone, you can hear us in stereo and boy, does it sound good. Keith Rowland, my webmaster, Dr. J, my producer, all of you, of course, the... Belgab website, StreamGuys, LV.net, and of course Peter Everhart, who sells stuff, brings us things like The Screaming Lady. <laughs> oh, actually, she's going to be a legend. All right, so today there was um, some interesting, not much news actually today. It was a very newsless day, but. There was an item uh, that I, I put on to that I thought was amazing. I think it is amazing. A boy who lost limbs to infection, he lost both, has received a double hand transplant in Philadelphia. Eight-year-old boy lost his limbs to a very, very serious infection and got a double hand transplant. Where are we going with medical science? Pretty soon, just about, I think, just about everything is going to be replaceable, isn't it? Then we'll be able to download our brains, I suppose. I received this note referenced last night's Grant Cameron show. Art, so glad you're back, listening to the show last night. And Greg Cameron was mentioning that some aliens, it was, of course, on abductions, some aliens won't, uh, they won't interfere with humans. That is, unless there is a nuclear threat. And uh, this young lady is wondering why they didn't interfere when the U.S. dropped bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. That's from Dawn in Monterey, California. Pretty good darn question, Dawn. Wish I'd thought of it last night when Cameron was here. You would think that uh, the very first ones uh, would have been absolute duds if they, in fact, had that power. So coming up tonight, we have, I think, the hottest thing in ufology right now. That's the way I build him, and that's the way others build him to me, Richard Dolan. He's been researching UFOs for 20 years, believes they constitute the greatest mystery of our time. He is the author of several volumes of history and a speculative book about the future, his latest work. In 2014, UFOs for the 21st Century Mind is a fresh treatment of the entire subject of UFOs. In it, he discusses the important sightings, the encounters, the politics, the cover-up, the aliens, the ancient ones, the bizarre science disclosure, offers advice on both uh, critical and open-minded uh, uh, thinking in today's world. Richard hosts his own weekly radio show. That's right. 
and is featured in the new television documentary, Books by Authors from Around the World. His website is richarddolanpress.com, R-I-C-H-A-R-D-O-L-A-N press.com. And um, in a moment, he's going to be here. He's going to talk about uh, ufology, perhaps in a way that uh, you've never heard it talked about before. Uh, very straight stuff. And, uh, you know, the first question I'm going to ask is the one that uh, was brought up last night by uh, Grant. And that is Grant absolutely is convinced that these are good guys, that no matter how many different types there may be out there, they're all good guys. So that's what's coming up. I'm Mark Bell from the high desert, which is beautiful at this time of night, 100 degrees earlier, but now it's gorgeous out there. This is midnight in the desert, raging into the night. As always, we'll be back as soon as they're done with their musical bumper. More of Art Bell and Richard Dolan in just a moment. Stay with us. They'll be right back. Now we return to Midnight in the Desert. I'm oh, sorry, just a second. Just a little bit at a time. I'm gonna bring him. Oh. Right again. Now we return to Midnight in the Desert. Uh, call Midnight in the Desert at MITD 51. That's MITD 51. Actually, don't call yet. Don't call yet. Just rest. We'll get to you. Your calls are coming. They're coming right now. Uh, from New York, it's Richard Dolan. Richard, welcome to uh, Midnight in the Desert. Uh, good evening, Art. Thank you for having me on. It's a real pleasure to uh, be able to talk with you, I think, for the first time. It is the first time. We've somehow missed each other over the years. <laughs> I, I don't know. The first well, thing I want to ask you about, if I can, uh, be, be, before I leave what happened last night here, that was Grant Cameron a Canadian fellow, who, no matter how I posed it, um, uh, Richard, uh, absolutely believes that uh, they, being all of them, all the different species that may be riding in these things that we talk about, UFOs, are warm, fuzzy little people who want nothing but the very best for us and our planet. We are all one. That kind of thing. And um, I sort of argued with that point of view. Um, I wonder how you feel about it, I can ask. I'm really glad that you jumped in with this question. Uh, first of all, Grant is not simply a respected colleague of mine. He, I consider him a friend, and I happen to be his publisher, believe it or not. Uh, a book that he wrote, uh, co-authored, is, um, is now a book that I published after Richard Dolan Press. I know Grant very, very well, and I've had this discussion with him, as a matter of fact. Um, I suppose I would say that I respectfully disagree with his fundamental perspective on this. I, I guess what I would say is that um, I don't I don't feel that I have enough information one way or the other to know definitively what the motives of these others, as I often call them. I don't know. I don't know that they're extraterrestrial alien. I don't know that they're black budget uh, terrestrial. I don't know that they're interdimensional. But I call them other. But I don't, I don't feel that really that not only do I not have enough information, but I'm not really sure that I'm able to get the amount of information to know their motives. I think they operate on a very different level than what we do. Um, I'm that's not a, that's a really good that. answer. That's a yeah. really good answer. I, how can we know? It's tricky because, uh, as you mentioned in your intro, I, I have been looking into this phenomenon for 20 years, which is not as long as probably many of the listeners or other researchers, but it's long enough. 
and I have thrown myself into this field. And um, the longer that I'm in it, the more I realize that we are we're dealing with some very very difficult mysteries, and and one of them is simply, you know, definitively getting the the intentions and motivations of what is the intelligence behind this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It's eluded us. I have ideas. I'm sure you have ideas, and I'm happy to speculate about them. But I, I really can't say that I know for sure. Have you have you had your own sightings or sighting? I had a couple of boring sightings. They're almost not even worth. <laughs> I mean, compared with what I've learned, what you know, interviewing many other people, uh, the the two uh, odd things that I've seen in the daytime sky here in Rochester, New York, where I'm living, are. Uh, not only great shakes. What really got me into this field, I, I simply backed into it through uh, academic training. That's really, back in the 90s, I was working on a PhD in history at the University of Rochester. I was doing graduate studies on Harry Truman. And, um, How does that get to UFOs? Well, it, it wouldn't normally. The academic world doesn't really lead you that way, but I uh, was bouncing around in a bookstore and I saw uh, Timothy Goods about Top Secret, which is a classic. And it was a subtitle, uh, The Worldwide UFO Cover-Up, that captured my attention. And I thought, oh, really? And I think like a lot of people in the world, they, they wonder at, at some point in, in everyone's life, I think they wonder, gee, I, I wonder if UFOs are real or if they're a thing. And simply because I was studying the late 1940s, which of course is the key years of the um, what people were saying was the UFO cover-up, I thought, well, I'd like to know. I don't want to go through my life wondering when I just figure it out. So I thought I would take a few months out of my life, and it's been 20 years. <laughs> and uh, would you, do you think you haven't figured it out yet? Well, you know, <laughs> I go further and further down the road, and I think that I learn more and more things about it. Uh, I don't think that any of us uh, no, is it. really going to get to the full bottom of it. But the, the thing is that the journey is the reward. And I do feel that I've learned quite a bit. I think that I've learned a lot about human civilization in the process, and I think I've probably learned a couple of things about myself, so it's absolutely worth the journey. Okay, there must have been some evidence, some thing that, as you were beginning in this journey, convinced you that it was worth continuing in this journey. In other words, some serious piece of evidence that you went, holy crap. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, I went into this uh, early 90s, like 93, 94, and I really just started by asking myself, well, what is the argument that those who believe in a cover-up or those who believe in the UFO reality, what what are they basing their argument on? Is it the logical thing to look into? And, and what I found um, was that there was a fairly large cache of documents that were released through the Freedom of Information Act, primarily back in the 1970s under the Jimmy Carter presidency, when freedom of information was actually at its peak. <laughs> um, it's gone through some ups and downs, lots of downs. But in the late 70s, it really was possible for researchers, uh, as it were, to shake that tree and for documents to come out. And there were quite a few. And um, what they're all in the public domain now. They're, they're out there. You can just read them. These were one secret classified documents in one way or another, and they, they tell a heck of a story. And um, so what they primarily tell us, I think, is uh, that there were innumerable violations of sensitive airspace back in the 40s, back in the 50s, by objects that, quite frankly, art were just not supposed to exist. That's right. And uh, But here they are being written about by our... Um, our national security people, the people in charge of running it. Uh, so there are a couple of documents. One is, a, a, several of them are famous among researchers. One is the so-called Twining Memo of 1947, and in that, a uh, three-star general, who later became a four-star general and chief of staff of the Air Force, Nathan Twining, wrote a letter in response to another general about these so-called flying disks that people were seeing all summer of 1947. And, and essentially, the general, uh, Charles Shulgin, wanted to know Basically, is this a thing? Do I have to deal with this? Is this something I have to be concerned about? Twining wrote back. He didn't say no. He, he, he actually said, yes, this is a thing, and it doesn't seem to be our thing. And in this letter, which was a classified memo at the time, he said uh, the reported characteristics are uh, – described them in, uh, in some detail. Silent or nearly silent. Mm -hmm. uh, evasive maneuvers when sighted. 
domed on top, flat on bottom. I thought that was rather interesting, and, and much more. So here you are, a classified memo in 1947. You have a top general describing this as a real thing. Uh, probably my favorite of the early memos that uh, I encountered back then was a letter, a memo to the director of the CIA back in late 1952, written by his chief of scientific intelligence. So those two very high-level peoples, and they were talking about the phenomenon. And um, there's one paragraph in the letter that I think is is like every American and world citizen should know. And he He's writing to his boss, and he says, at this time, the reports of incidents convinced us that there is something going on which must have immediate attention. Sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes and traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles. Now, that's late 1952, and I mean, quite honestly, when I, I read that, about 20 years ago when I was just getting started in this, and I thought, holy smokes, if that, you know, you, you're not really going to say, boss, I think we're being invaded in a top-secret classified memo to the mm. CIA, but this is about as close as you're going to get. He's ruling out Soviet, basically. He's ruling out any kind of known technology. He's ruling out natural phenomena. He's talking about these are unexplained at uh, insensitive areas. Um, what more do you want? So clearly this was something important. Okay, it, 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 comes to a, it, it comes to a conclusion, right? Or if it doesn't, then I can come to one from what I just heard. If something is traveling in our skies at altitudes we can't or couldn't at that time do, right. and going at speeds that we can't even imagine, then the conclusion has got to be, particularly if it's near national security installations, that all of this does represent a potential or real threat to national security. Absolutely. That's exactly the conclusion that I think that they came to, and I think that is exactly why there has been high levels of secrecy on this subject right from the beginning. And, I mean, doesn't it make perfect sense? That was my conclusion after I read enough of these documents. And so I've been working uh, for the last couple of decades trying to put this whole story together. And in a sense... Uh, kind of mainstream the UFO story and, and kind of connect it to the rest of American and world history and right. try to see it within that context. Okay, well, if that's true, if that is, and I, it could not have come to any other conclusion, but if that is what they came to, then you can almost bet that the documents you're, you're quoting from back then must be nothing compared to what you could get if you really could get okay. documents today. Oh, absolutely. Abs In fact, this is such a pertinent question you just asked, because of the Freedom of Information Act documents that we received, especially back during the glory era of the 70s, mm -hmm. even then, uh, this was no walk in the park to get them. Uh, the highest levels of classification were and, and remain really off limits to us. That is, anything above the level of secret. We really haven't gotten anything. That, that means top secret and beyond top secret, which we know there are classifications beyond. Uh, what we have are secret, confidential, restricted, really classified, yes, but lower levels of classification. And, and this is significant because we have it on the authority of at least one classified FBI document from 1949 that the matter of UFOs or flying saucers was, in fact, considered top secret. And so the fact that it was of that classification and yet we haven't really gotten any of them except the few that were highly redacted and blacked out. <laughs> uh, so there's obviously a story that is left to be told from back then and, yes, from today, uh, most definitely because the Freedom of Information Act, I think, is much less user-friendly than it was back in uh, the Jimmy Carter years. Well, there was a big flurry, of course, back in those years, as you mentioned, of you know people spotting UFOs and all kinds of things in our skies. Yeah. What about... More recent years, uh, as you look at the various sightings, oh, I don't know, um, Phoenix Lights comes to mind. Um, what's been the most recent significant thing? Well, in the last decade, there, there's first of all, I guess I would like to mention that if one were to go online and look for contemporary UFO reports, mm -hmm. I think people would be rather blown away by how many sightings just in North America alone. You go to the two main websites that are out there. There's the National UFO Reporting Center, right? and then there's the uh, MUFON site, the Mutual UFO Network, and both of them collect 
UFO sightings, what we might call raw reports, so people see something and there's no investigation, but they'll they'll type it in and put it on the site. So admittedly, they're they're raw, but if you just combine the sightings from those two websites alone, and I do not believe there's a lot of overlap, for 2014, I did a tally, and we're talking about 14,000 reports in North America, U.S. and Canada for those two sites. 14,000 is an unbelievable amount. Uh, I'm not suggesting that all of them are alien craft or even black budget craft. But a lot there's of a lot are, of things that are, are seemingly inexplicable that you yeah, see. A lot of them are Venus. A lot of them are aircraft. Um, yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I mean, a lot of them I think are explainable. But, but um, I mean, I've gone through a lot of the reports, and some of them I think are quite interesting. But of, of recent spectacular sightings, um, you know, if you asked me this question a year or two from now, I'd probably have a great answer because mm. I'm working on the third volume of UFOs in a National Security State, which covers the recent years. But I can, I'll tell you offhand, I mean, two of the big ones, uh, famous ones, and I think are important, is the 2008 Stephenville, Texas sighting, mm -hmm. which was seen by many people, and the object that a lot of very qualified witnesses described was, was enormous, absolutely enormous. A few of them got a very close view of it, um, and that object was being pursued by F-16 jet interceptors, and we've got a lot of good data on that that sighting. Any, um, any video? Hmm? Any video? No, no, unfortunately. What we do have is radar data, however, which was okay. acquired by MUFON from the FAA, and so we do know that there was an object tracked by FAA, an unknown, and we do have uh, trackings of the F-16s who were... Um, seemingly in pursuit of it. So there is there is some data. You've got that and, and you've got some witness testimony that uh, I think is actually quite compelling. And then the other one that I think, and I, I personally did some investigation into this, and it's a well-known case from 2002 uh, near Washington, D.C. This is another case in which F-16 jet interceptors were chasing multiple unidentified objects that seemingly had the ability totally to outperform them. Mm -hmm. I spoke to two witnesses directly. This did get reported in the Washington Post and got repeated elsewhere. Um, the One of the Air Force uh, individuals who was interviewed for that story, unnamed, but said, we had it on radar and it just disappeared off the radar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just so, disappeared. I mean, th there are some good sightings. They go on in this century, and there's many, many more. Um I think those are the two spectacular ones probably in America of the 21st century off, off the top of my head. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, let's not forget the O'Hare Airport site oh, yes. in 2006. Oh, That's, yes. Uh, that one slipped my mind. All right. So here's another one for you. Uh, one of the things that we used to rely on is pretty much gone now, and that is photographic evidence. Um, oh, yeah. There, There's just no way... That, that I know of, that you can actually verify that something you're looking at has not been created or tampered with. We've actually gotten so good with CGI that, how do, how do you feel about that? Can, can photographs be verified as not messed with? I have a really hard time with photographs these days. I, I can almost, I would almost say that I don't even consider them evidence anymore, which is a shame. But uh, for the reason that you're expressing, uh, the, the ability to fake is so good now. But I would, I would qualify it and say everything in context. So it really comes down to uh, witness testimony combined with photographic evidence. If an investigator is uh, looking into a sighting and you do have multiple witnesses um, that are, let's say, independent of each other, you know, there's ways of kind of gauging that, I suppose. And, um, and if they have photographic evidence with their testimony, I think you, know, you have to look at it, obviously, and do your best to have it analyzed in a, in a careful way. There are people who are good at detecting uh, CGI effects. Uh, no one is probably perfect. I'm, I'm disinclined to throw out photographic or video evidence, for that matter, out of hand, but we do have to be very, very, very cautious in, um, in dealing with it, for sure. A recent one that I saw that was really intriguing was the cube. Have you seen I'm not, you've I'm not seen, sure I saw that one. What? You haven't seen the cube? <laughs> really? It's this black cube-shaped thing that oh, comes boy. out of a cloud. It's pretty amazing. I'm surprised yeah. that you would not have seen it. Well, I mean, I, I'm doing a lot of different <laughs> projects right now. So. I is, see. It, is it totally recent? or, um, or what? Fairly recent, yes, it is. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I'm sure it, I would have come across it. 
Um, I don't know. I, I don't really know what to say about that. I, I get, uh, you know, people show me UFO videos every, several every week. I mean, I'm constantly sure. being asked to comment. And it's funny to me because I, I mean, other than the fact that I write about this subject and I, and I've looked at a lot of UFO video, I'm, I'm really not any more of an expert on detecting uh, fakes than, than the next guy out there. Uh, there are people who are really skilled at it, and, and I'm not particularly one of them, but I do get shown these things all the time. Well, I recently saw um, an earthquake movie, that, and the CGI was so good in it that um, as they showed California being destroyed, you couldn't tell it from the real thing for the most part. I mean, it was Just that sure. good. So, uh, you know, we're sort of doomed in the photographic area, I guess. Um, well, it's tricky. Uh, the, the only thing that I would um, suggest is that we're... I, you know, I feel like we're developing new m means of electronic detection all the time, not simply um, old-fashioned uh, photographs, but uh, infrared and, um, and heat sensor type um, means of detection and, and other things. And so <clears throat> I think there's a lot of different data that increasingly is coming our way. And I, I don't, I mean, presumably everything can be faked, but... Um, you know, it's possible that that there are new means of detection coming along all the time, or that we that we use it. Well, when radar tracks something doing 25 or 30 thousand miles an hour through our atmosphere, and there have been those detections, um, that's incredibly fast. Nothing even close to what we can do, unless it's a rocket. I mean, these things are traversing the atmosphere and making turns. Yeah. Would, you know, turn us into jelly, that sort of thing. We do have that and it, it seems real and then of course we have the military as you pointed out earlier chasing these things as well as well they should well right i mean you've got i mean think about the situation back in the 1940s uh world war ii had just ended the most titanic military struggle in the history of the human race had just ended you've got millions of people around the world homeless millions more on the brink of starvation and now here's the united states with this phenomenon of unknown things, whatever they are, uh, making their appearance. And, you know, the question would be, do you really tell the public about this uh, before you yourself even have a handle on it? And of course, you're going to take it seriously um, and, you know, have your military look into it. And you're not going to just advertise this to the public until you have at least an idea of what the heck you're dealing with. Well, do you tell the public is a really, really big question. And... I have thought about this for years, and I used to say, you know, I think that the answer is probably not. In other words, if they know that we're being visited regularly by some creatures from somewhere, and they really know this for sure, the implications of telling the public, well, Brookings, uh, I felt, might have had it right. Uh, I'll tell you what, hold on, we're at a break point. You can actually relax for a few moments. We've got uh, our newscast on. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back to Richard Dolan. I'm Art Bell. I don't know if I did get the newscast that he's referring to. If we do, we will take it. If not, we will return once their musical bumper is concluded. I'm Leo Ashcraft. Earthquakes around an active underwater volcano off the coast of Granada in the West Indies have locals worried. The residents have noticed more gas bubbles rising to the surface of the ocean this month. The volcano known as Kikum Jinni is about 180 meters below the surface of the ocean. Because of the rise in earthquake shutters, we've had over 200 this month alone, as well as the gas expulsions, the Seismic Research Center at the University of West Indies moved the alert status to orange this week, but has since moved it back to yellow. While Kikum Jinni is located about five miles away from Granada, the real danger is to boats coming into it and going away from the island as the volcanic gas and matter could heat up the surrounding waters to a toasty 302 degrees. An exclusion zone has also been marked out for passing boat traffic to stay about three miles away from the volcano. 
kick of Jenny has erupted over a dozen times since its discovery in 1939, with its last eruption being in 2001. This is Dark Matter News. Only 12 people have walked on the moon, and we haven't been back since 1972. But a new NASA Commission study has found that we can now afford to set up a permanent base on the moon by mining for lunar resources and partnering with private companies. Returning humans to the moon could cost 90% less than expected, bringing estimated costs down from $100 billion to $10 billion. That's something that NASA could afford on its current deep space human spaceflight budget. Mark Hopkins, the executive committee chair of the National Space Society, said in a press release that a factor of 10 reduction in cost changes everything. The study released this week was conducted by the National Space Society and the Space Frontier Foundation, two nonprofit organizations that advocate building human settlements beyond Earth, and it was reviewed by an independent team of former NASA executives, astronauts, and space policy experts. Science has a fetish for trying to amalgamate humanity with machines. And its latest endeavor in this pursuit has taken the form of an emergency brain implant technology that would render humans part flesh, part computer. Researchers from the University of California, Berkeley, have come up with a concept they've dubbed neural dust that they say can be implanted into people's brains for data collection purposes. The technology is reportedly so small that humans wouldn't even know it was inside their heads. Using a special wire apparatus, the neural dust can be dipped into a person's cerebral cortex where it would remain embedded indefinitely. And since it's powered by special piezoelectric materials, this dust wouldn't require a recharge, which means once it's there, it's there for good. This neural dust contains a complementary metal oxide semiconductor. This allows it to monitor and track a person's brain activity. After gathering data, the dust then transmits it to a special transmitter installed on a person's scalp. The team that came up with the idea claims neural dust could be used to treat chronic diseases and severe disabilities with greater ease. That's the good side of this. The bad side is microscopic cranial implants offer a way for nefarious entities to literally enter the minds of humans, perhaps undetected, and track their thoughts and behaviors. Many say this is a much more likely scenario, a type of mark of the beast for one's brain that could allow governments to control people's minds. Consider the fact that the American military has openly admitted to funding brain-computer projects capable of controlling people's thoughts and emotions. To the tune of $70 million, the U.S. military funded research into implantable electrodes that could be installed into people's brains to both read and control their emotions. And the reasoning was to help mentally ill people recover from their demons and addictions. How these new brain implants will be used in the future? All the time will tell. But our generation has truly outlived science fiction. For Dark Matter News, I'm Leo Ashcraft. Thank you, Leo. And again, once our musical interlude does, we'll return to Richard Dolan and Art Bell. Who will return on Dancing Queen. As we go to our final fight in the meantime. So we will return to Midnight in the Desert with Richard Dolan and Art Bell from July 28th, 2015. So here's your host, Art Bell, and guest, Richard Dolan. Between dusk and dawn, from the high desert, it's Art Bell's Midnight in the Desert. Now, here's Art. Hi. That's a very popular song associated with my program, and you know who I think did that besides me? I think it was Phil Henry. Every time he did a parody of me, there were many, he used this song. So that's how identified it is. My guest is Richard Dolan. And uh, he's sort of at the top of the UFO community right now in the United States, if not worldwide, um, and thought of very, very well, does a great deal of talks, and uh, probably has paid very, very well for them, and for a good reason. 
He was a good talker. Okay, so we were talking about whether or not we tell the we, whether whoever it is that has this information makes it public or doesn't make it public. And Brookings, a long time ago, did a study that said it American institutions would fall. Religious people would get very upset uh, if we knew they were here. And then there's also one other school of thought that I'll throw in, and you can pick from, and that is that our own U.S. military uh, is pretty darn good, best in the world, I guess. And frankly, uh, if the U.S. military can't catch these things, can't bring them down, can't affect them, then, well, that's not something you'd want to tell the American people. You know, some flying over our sensitive military installations, and we don't seem to be able to do anything about it. That's not something you'd probably make public. Um, so how do you come down on all this? Yeah, well, first of all, I guess I just want to jump in and say that uh, as far as getting paid well for conferences and the like, that, that, that would be great if that were the case. But uh, uh, that circuit doesn't... Um, if someone goes into the UFO field for the money, then they're they're under a really big misapprehension about what how much money is there. Uh, although I enjoy what I do, I feel like a very lucky guy that I get to research this and uh, and spend my life uh, looking into these questions and meeting amazing people. Well, they ought to be paying you very well. Leave it at that. I, I'm say that I, I, I said that. they ought to be paying you very oh, well, and, and that, uh, that whoever nice. offers yes, him be, uh, a chance to talk. Say yes. No. Yes. Uh, whoever uh, regarding, yeah, regarding your question about uh, what to do regarding secrecy and telling the public, this yes. is an important issue for me, uh, I guess philosophically in my work. I write about it a lot. It's, uh, it's something that always comes up. And whereas it's very easy, okay, to see the motivation that the military would have, the national security community would have in wanting to keep this secret, obviously they have their reasons. Uh, but I would I would maintain that their reasons are not the sum total of the reasons we have to be considering. Um, uh, because I think what's happened is that the secrecy relating to UFOs has had a very negative effect on our society, a very negative effect on our civilization. I think it's had a kind of a dissolving effect on the kind of Republican institutions that those of us who believe in such things grew up uh, being taught, you know, this was our society, and I think that they really don't exist anymore. And the UFO secret is one, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why they Basically, what we have, I think, is a corpus of a republic. Um, so I would say that the, the real fundamental issue is, um, you know, we've got secrecy now going on, not, not just for the first five years during the Truman year administration, but it's gone on for an entire human lifetime, you know, 70 years, basically. And I really think we need to ask as a society, A, is this really what it, it, we want? I mean... In other words, being spoon-fed lies for the rest of our life, uh, which requires, by the way, control, total control over the mainstream establishment media, total control over the uh, key academic institutions that are involved here because they, they have to be kept in line, total control over the political institutions globally uh, in order to maintain secrecy on this, this fiction that there, there's no, that there are no other beings being with us when all the evidence shows that they are. So I think what it does is it just does bad things to a society and civilization and human psychology when you have to live a kind of fake reality, which I think is what's happened. So, no, I, I actually come down on the side that, look, at, no matter how bad the situation may be, and I don't, I don't have all of the facts at my disposal, but uh, I do – I will retain a faith in the value of truth. I will always do that, and I, and I retain a faith in the value of democratic rule. I'm never going to give up on that. So I think that uh, if, if I'm going to live in this world as a human being and as a citizen of the world and a member of the human race, then I'm going to live in it as someone who believes in the value of truth over all things and in the value of human dignity. So I don't, I don't want to be treated like a child. I How do we, okay, so we have this out in the open. Yeah. Just, How do we get to it? it? How do we get to it, Richard? Well, <laughs> that's, that's the question. Um, I, I would say a couple of things. One, we're, we're living in... Very revolutionary times. This isn't 1950. This isn't even 1990. This is we're in 2015. You know, um, organizations like WikiLeaks have only been around for about 10 years. And the only reason they've been around only 10 years is that they really couldn't exist more than 10 years ago because we didn't have a global infrastructure to accommodate 
groups like that, you know, organizations like Anonymous who could just take digital data and, and grab it and throw it out there for the world <laughs> yes. to see. And, and so it's a new world now. We're in a world where everyone's got smartphones. And uh, admittedly, that means an explosion of YouTube videos, but it, I still maintain the idea that at some point there's going to be a sighting that hits the, the proverbial sweet spot and there's going to be multiple people capturing an object that's going to be maybe difficult to explain away. Um, that's a matter of faith, I will, I will grant you, but I think it's, it's likely. So what I think is going to happen, I, I think in such a tumultuous era that we are in, that to assume that tomorrow is going to look like today I think is a bit foolish, and I therefore believe that um, something's going to happen that's going to open this up unexpectedly. Uh, I don't believe that the, uh, the powers that be have any real desire to uh, acclimate us to the reality. Some people believe that I, I'm not in that camp. I think they're going to keep the lid on this as long as possible, but the fact is that they can't, they can't do it forever. I mean, there are just too many factors involved. So I'm waiting for something explosive to happen, and I'm not sure I'm able to predict that, but it could be a signing, it could be a leak. Um, All right, how, how about this? Um, you know, the people who have been keeping these secrets, if we assume that somewhere around 45 it all began, the people who have been keeping these secrets are now getting old, and they're getting close to passing on, and you would think that a lot of people would want to unburden themselves uh, before the end. Yeah, well, I think I think that a lot of that original generation might have felt that way, but I I also believe that this is a very profitable secret. So um, I don't I don't think there's a lot of incentive for like as new people come in. I think they're making money off of this, and and here's why I think that um, because I think part of the UFO secret involves acquired technology. Mm -hmm. So let's say let's talk about something like Roswell, which I think was in fact the recovery of exotic technology that is not from our civilization. That, that's a long conversation we could have, but I, I believe that is the case. And in fact, I believe that there are other instances as well in which it seems probable that we acquired some of their stuff. And, and what that would mean, I mean, that's holding the, the future in your hands. And so what I think happens is if you're the army, you've got this material, you're going to very carefully parcel it out to your key defense contractors and research and development people, mm -hmm. and they're going to figure it out. And, and suddenly you've got a goose that's laying golden eggs. You've got or an iPhone. Money here. And no incentive <laughs> yeah. giving it up. Or an iPhone. I mean, who knows what we have now uh, come from elsewhere. Some of the technology to do it may have come from elsewhere. I think we got a boost. Um, I mean, I, I believe that our own scientific trajectory, I guess that's the way to put it, mm -hmm. probably would get us on the path that we are on. But I, I happen to think that acquired technology through uh, retrievals has probably sped things up a bit. Hmm. Uh, by the way, uh, when you get a break, or anybody else out there, I got a whole bunch of computer messages. What's the cube, they said. So oh, I, I just looked at that. I, it's at the top of our – oh, you did. It's at the top of artbell.com website right now if you go there. So midnight in the desert. So um, yeah, take a look break, at it. I, I saw an article on it. Yeah, uh, the raw cube is not so good, but the video, there is a video associated oh, okay. with it, and it's okay. astounding. I mean, it, you can actually see this thing breaking out of a cloud. It's pretty amazing. Uh, the the photograph I'm seeing, the article I'm seeing by the way is really not the best article. It's, it has a lot of irrelevancies in it, but I'm seeing an image of uh, what looks like a black cube and a lot of kind of smoke above it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the same thing you're seeing. It is quite interesting. Yeah, you've got to see the whole video. Like so before. when you get a couple of minutes, just click on the video and take a look. It's really astounding. Anyway, um, so you you think that. We could take the truth. Do you think it would upset existing institutions? I don't think we're ever going to be ready for the truth, ever. Never. Not ever. <laughs> but, but who's ever ready for their first kid? No one, and you yeah. have it anyway. Uh, right. I, I think that, frankly, uh, no, the truth on the UFO matter, I, uh, my, my position is, I, and really it's not for me to say, are we ready or not. I, I mean, history is just going to go. We're, we're on a, a path here. It's going to happen. I don't think there's anyone that's really going to be able to stop this. We are moving along, and this truth is going to come out. And when it does, I believe, it's going to be very messy, and it's going to be highly disruptive. In fact, it's going to be revolutionary in every conceivable way. 
I know there'd probably be a lot of people angry at me and maybe angry at you for being the kinds of people to talk about this and maybe helping to speed up the process for all I know. But it's going to be irrelevant. It's, it's going to happen. I do think when it does, and, and I co-authored a book on this exact question. It doesn't even make me an expert, but it does mean I've thought about it. I think that it's going to be a, a political nightmare for the powers that be because I think people will, will not only – want to know, first of all, are we safe? Who are these other beings? Mm -hmm. uh, are, are they here to help us or to eat us? But then there's going to be a political blowback against the very institutions, that, and people are going to realize that they've been lied to fundamentally for generations. And mm -hmm. I'm sure, I mean, there are some people who are just willing to roll over and take it, but I think a lot of people will be very unhappy, and there, I think some heads will roll politically. Uh, how far that will go is the real question. You know, will we have in Remember Occupy Wall Street. Well, we have Occupy Area 51 or Occupy Wright Patterson Air Force Base or whatever. I don't know. But I think that there's potential for a lot of anger. Um, and I think that's an opportunity, frankly, for us to uh, hopefully remake this uh, society of ours into something approximating a free republic. Uh, I don't think we have it now. I think it's, it's been dead for a while. I think we have a kind of oligarchy, and again, the UFO secret's been part of the part of the impetus to create that oligarchy. So, it just might be that disclosure—that's the word a lot of people use—could be uh, ultimately a good thing. It will be upsetting. I think it will be. Um, it'll turn a lot of things upside down. I I met with a lady. I went to the bank the other day, and lady uh, bank teller asked what I did for a living. I said, "Well, I write books on UFOs." Hmm. I, I just come out. I don't care. And she had this look of a real horror on her face. She actually looked very scared. She said, I don't want to talk about that. That frightens me. Uh -huh. And I think that there's a lot of people like that. But the fact is, they'll have to deal with it. Uh, you know, you can spend the rest of your life pulling your hair out of your head, running around in circles. Or at some point, you're going to have to catch your breath and say, all right, this is real. What next? Well, I think you were right about the current state of things. And this is only a little bit political. Uh, Donald Trump is just doing amazing things. Love him, hate him, whatever. However you feel about him, it doesn't matter. He's saying all these wild things, and he's going up and up and up. No matter how wild and how bad, he keeps going up. And I, you know, I think that translates to um, we're ready to burn it all down, kind of. Yeah, well, I, I think, uh, and also, wh whether whatever one feels about Trump, I think the reason people gravitate him to him right now is simply because they know every politician out there really is just a professional liar. That's what I mean by and, burn it um, all down. <laughs> yeah, and, and Trump is saying things that are very politically incorrect, as it were. And a lot of people, I think, they sense that, you know, there's a guy, wh whether he's being truthful in his motivations or not, it's another thing, but he certainly sounds different than the other guys. Yeah, I, I think it just shows that the public is fed up. Just, you know, every year they say, take America back, all, all this sort of stuff. But this time, I think what Trump is doing represents a revolution in thinking in America by Americans. We'll see. We'll see. Well, I was waiting for people to latch on to Ron Paul, which, in fact, they did, and he just got no media love. But, hey, that's just me. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I loved him, too. And I interviewed him. He's a very nice guy. Yeah. Uh all right, so where, where to go now? Somebody asks on the computer for you to please address the whole controversy around the Roswell slides. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. No. Um, sure. <laughs> well, I, that, that was a big thing a few months ago, and uh, some people, I guess, are still interested in that. So what happened was, and I, I played a peripheral role in this, uh, peripheral at best, but I, I was involved for the, uh, the great unveiling, as it were, of them in Mexico City a couple of months ago. So, uh, for several years, researchers Donald Schmidt and Tom Carey, who wrote uh, a very excellent book on Roswell called Witness to Roswell, I highly recommend it, uh, came across what they thought was uh, evidence that was presented to them of two old Kodachrome slides that uh, belonged to a deceased individual, actually a deceased couple, from the 1940s that appeared to them to depict uh, an alien body on right. the glass. Right. 
So Don and Tom had this for a while, and, and they um, and, and they'll be the first to tell you now. They got very excited about this, and they were very gung ho. Uh, they believed they had something, and um, did, rather than just putting it out there, they uh, went and looked for their own experts and wanted to investigate it before they went any further with right. it. Which I don't really fault them for that that policy. So they. Um, Spent some money, they looked around, they found people to analyze the slides themselves, the data of the slides, and, and on and on and on. And, um, and the more they looked into it, the more they thought this is very interesting. Uh, they eventually connected with Jaime Mousson mm -hmm. of Mexico, and many people know about Jaime. Yes. Jaime uh, put some serious money behind the research and actually got uh, a number of uh, academicians in Mexico to look at the uh, the physiology of the body itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was actually what intrigued me for at least a little while. Those physiologists said this is not a human being, this is not a mummy, this is uh, an unusual body and it doesn't seem to be a human being at all. At that point, uh, shortly before they were going to do a big reveal in Mexico City on May 5th of this year, they asked me if I would participate in it. Yes. And I... Um, I took a, about a week to decide, and after a long conversation with Don Schmidt, who I, is a friend of mine, and I've known Don for years, and I respect him, he believed, and also I spoke at length to a, another researcher named Tony Bergaglia, who some people don't know Tony, but he's a, an active blog writer and, and a good guy. I like Tony. So I spoke to both of them, and they both knew about this, and they were both deeply impressed by the slide. And I went on site on scene, so I didn't see the slide. And, and admitted they didn't really... I don't know if they didn't trust me or if they didn't want to show me, but I didn't see it until I went to Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And um, so I go down there, and what I was impressed by, at least for the, the day that I was there before the thing was unveiled, were the analysis of the, uh, the Mexican physiologist and a Canadian physiologist as well who said this is not a human being. And I thought, well, this isn't proof of anything, and I always maintained it wasn't proof of any alien body. But I did say... That seems compelling to me, and if it's going to be debunked, I, I would think some physiologists need to debunk it. Well, here's what happened. So it gets uh, revealed on May 5th, big auditorium in Mexico City, webcam, and the, I think three or four days later, uh, a group of uh, independent researchers looking at it said, we've, re we've deciphered the fuzzy placard in front of this thing, which no one was able to read, and it says definitively that this is a, a two-year-old child mummy. And, I, I mean, that absolutely settled it. Um, so that's it. That's, that's really the Roswell slide thing. Now, the other aspect of it, I guess I would say, is that this turned into, in my opinion, it turned into like this UFO Armageddon in the minds of some people, which I don't really think it was. It was a mistake. Um, Don and Tom in particular, yes, they got really behind this, and they absolutely believed that this was an alien body, and they explicitly connected it to Roswell. All right, I, I'm sorry to do this. Yeah, it was a mistake, but yeah. I think that's really what it is, and life goes on. All right, and indeed, life goes on. And I might add, it cost some people a lot of money, that's for sure. Roswell slides. Okay, Richard Dolan is my guest. We're talking UFOs. We'll be right back. And that's where we will leave that for the evening as we're not going to be able to fit another segment in with the time remaining. Tonight, so make sure you do come back tomorrow for more lovely content that we have. Or that one thing I do want to do that we haven't been able to do the last couple days, especially in part two, because we've been stuck with a more case that I wasn't really expecting. So, normally during part two, we do air what we call the Judge Judy Hyper Case of the Evening. A.K.A. a very sped up, quick, just the facts, bam, bam, bam type situation of a case that Judge Judy heard. And for the last two nights, we haven't done 
any of those because of what we've got. So we've got about five minutes left, and we should be able to get to Judge Judy Hypercases in. So we'll do that to finish out our evening. First, we have Judge Judy handling an evasive plaintiff. And you were dodging her. That was not bad. Uh, absolutely. Did you give her her thousand dollars? No. Well, she's going to get it today. <laughs> so let's understand what the ground rules are here. Your allegation is that Miss Wilson vandalized your car. Yes. And the accident to her car that you caused happened on what date? It happened on May 1st. Now, she had your name yes. and telephone number. Did you ever speak to her on the phone? Well, she did. She claimed she did. I didn't give her the. She didn't write down the right number at first. Well, she called Progressive, and Progressive was calling me, and I told Progressive to give her my right phone number. So not only did you give her no insurance card because she didn't have one, but you gave her a phony number when she wrote down your number. No, I did not. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, yes, you did. I didn't give her a phone number. Yes. I told Progressive to give her the actual that phone was a, number. That was only because she got called by what you considered an authority. Well, she but at the street, when you asked her for your name, you gave her your name, didn't give her your license, didn't give her registration for the car, didn't give her anything, and you gave her a telephone number that turned out to be wrong. So she wrote it down wrong. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. She's driving a brand new car. That you just hit in an accident that was your fault. I guarantee you, Miss Wilson did not write down the number wrong, because that doesn't make sense. What makes sense is that you were smart, man, and gave her the wrong number and figured she would go away. She didn't go away. Next. Alrighty, so let's go. Where we got? Ah, we can go with. Yeah, let's go with it. Judy, Judge Judy with her least favorite case of her life. Mary Sexton and her sister Carol Smuda are suing their former friend, Aaron Barnack, for the return of money they gave him to secure a horse trailer. Well, Sexton, when you bring a drunk home from a bar... Yes, ma'am. That's very nice. I wasn't talking to you. That's about me. When you bring a drunk home from a bar and start giving him money, it's sort of ridiculous. Uncross your hands. It's sort of ridiculous to come to court and expose your stupidity. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yes, ma'am. I gave him money the 30th for his, his car for gas. It was after we went to church. There are no 30 days in February. Oh, well, then it must have been the first. <laughs> I want you to tell me how much money you gave him. I gave him... Just tell me how much. 200 Actually, more than that, but I, I did. Yep. Got it. She don't even know what she's talking about. I don't want to hear from you. Well, I mean, Yet. it's a hug my case, so I figured I'd see my piece. When I let you. Okay. Well, you let me know when I'm able to talk, then. You got it. Right You'll be able to tell. I'll be looking in your direction. And I'll be looking in yours. That's the best place to look in this room. All right. <laughs> Let's say 200 And when did he say he would pay it back? Part of it was Sunday night. and He, he said he would pay you back Sunday night? Six, the $60 that I gave him for cash, and he didn't. And did she give him a whole bunch of money? She actually gave him the 1400 Saturday. And he was supposed to pay you back by when? He was supposed to give her a trailer. No, he was supposed to pay you back by when? Friday. That's what I said. So after he didn't pay you back on Friday, your sister gave him $1,400. Yeah. The $1,400 you gave him because he was acting as a middleman to buy a trailer that you wanted? She's poking you. Yeah, she backed out. <laughs> I'm not looking in your direction. I'm not looking in your direction. I gave him $1,400 because he said he had a friend who had a horse trailer. I gave him $1,700. $1,700. They, they came to my... Shh. Okay, listen. This is my least favorite case of the day because I hate dealing with dumb women. Sometimes, I'd, so you sort of get sucked up into the situation, you know? They're nice to you. They've taken you out for dinner a couple of times. But you bring home a drunk from a bar and start giving him money as a woman I resent that kind of stupidity. 
I respect that, ma'am. Now I'm going to look in your direction. I'm going to ask you some questions. <laughs> How much money did you give him? Um, uh, that requires a number. And what did you do with the other two hundred? That she said she gave you seventeen hundred dollars. That was that was for my. That was your commission. Yeah, that was for my. But car. you gave fifteen hundred dollars to Mr. Billy. Right. Okay. Listen to me. No. No more. Oh, you're not getting no. it from him. Excuse my language, I'm sorry. Just a minute, put your hands down. Do you know who you are? Yep. Okay, then. You want to act like you know who you are? Yep. All right, then watch your language. Do that for me, all right? I apologize. Personal favor. All right. All right. All right. All right. I'd like all to right. submit this evidence. The night that he came over to look for a saddle, he was looking, he came over to my house to buy a saddle for me, and that's how he knew that I had horses. I don't even have a horse. And he wanted to buy a saddle. He called this so-called place on his cell phone and put $500 on this trailer for $3,500. He wanted the money up front, so I gave him cash, $1,200 in cash dealing with him. I gave him another $250 in cash plus the $250, which is a drink jack with the trip. Do you have the number for the people to whom you gave the $1,500? The answer would be either yes or no. No. All right. Well, then, you owe her $1,700. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of $1,700. You, on the other hand, get nothing. Hey, no, my excuse dad. me. Hey, I'm not speaking to you. Well, I'm minute. speaking to you. Put him out. Oh, he's our excuse, sir. So step up. And with that, of course, make sure you do like, share, and subscribe. Get us to those goals of 50,000 views and 1,000 subscribers. So, Boxy will send those nice, beautiful red boxes that we can send to you, little guys. And, of course, that Google YouTube will pay attention to us. Coinbase and about or below, I'm not going to go through them as you hear it all the time. If you want them, there they are to go ahead and get those lovely, lovely free money. Till then, make sure you do like, share, and subscribe. Be kind to one another, because, of course, in the end, that's all we have. It's a great new world to release the Krakens. I hope you have a great night. Enjoy your night's sleep. And we'll see you tomorrow as we continue to march along here from day one. Have a great night, and again, enjoy your ride.